I've got some good news for you folks. Well, that's not the good news. That's good news, but uh, we've got a living hope in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, here with us today. We have no better reason to sing, no better reason to celebrate than Jesus Christ, our living hope. Isn't that great? Thank you so much for celebrating and singing that together. Oh, my goodness. It is tremendous. Um, if you're visiting with us today, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here. We're so glad to have you here. See some new faces, which is always a blessing. Uh, and so we hope that you feel at home. And I hope somebody here is shook in your hand or smiled at you or did something to let you know that you're loved. Um, Trevor's parents are here today. Great, great to have you here and in, in your family. We just love your family. So thanks for coming. We can give them a round of applause. Wonderful to have them here, and uh, thank you so much. It's good to be back. Uh, we were uh, in Illinois for the last 12 days for a vacation. You know, you should really see the faces of people in Illinois when you tell them that you come from Florida to vacation in Illinois. Uh, it's, it's really quite interesting. They go... <laughs> like they don't get it. Um, but we were there. We, we did a wedding there for my sister-in-law, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and we got to experience um, the winter in its full effect. That big cold front that swept through the nation was in right there when we got there. And so it was 10 degrees. We were greeted with that and then three inches of snow. Uh, and so the kids loved that. I didn't like it so much. But what I really liked was saying sayonara and then leaving <laughs> And coming back here, which is great, uh, uh, my wife stayed up there for um, a funeral. So she actually uh, flew a plane from Illinois to Boston, and she'll be back this afternoon. So I had all four kids, drove them back in the car. There was a lot of bribery and sugar and DVDs and things <laughs> happening. But we made it back alive. And uh, I tell you what, you know, they have all these TV shows, these reality TV shows. I think they should do one where... Like the spouse or like the husband or the wife, they take, they do the work of the other person for like three or four days. You know, like where like someone, would, like my wife come do my job and I go do my wife's job for a week. And you would like really come to appreciate all the work that they do. Having my wife gone for the last four days, I mean, I just like sing her praises. All the work that she does with these kids running around. Um, we did a, a, the quinceanera last night and we had ballet and we have ballet today and the children's program. It is so much stuff. And I just like praise her for for all the work she does. And uh, so next week, if you see Christine preaching the sermon, you'll know why uh, it'd be fun. But so we're going to be wrapping up this series that we've been in for about 10 weeks. And um, uh, it's sad to believe in this, and, uh, but it's also been such a fruitful time. But I'm really excited because we get to jump into the Christmas season. And I'm really big into Christmas. I'm one of those guys. And so if you're coming to church here, you're going to see a lot of great Christmas stuff. You're going to see ugly Christmas sweaters. You're going to see and hear music, the traditional. We just love everything about Christmas, at least I do. Um, and uh, Trevor came up with our theme this year, which is really exciting. Um, we're going to be talking about some of these great classic songs that we sing, and we're going to be focusing on the real reason for Christmas and our Savior coming down to this planet. And uh, Trevor found a song, and we're going to use that song as the theme. The theme is going to be, Here Comes Heaven. Here Comes Heaven. And I can't wait to celebrate heaven coming down to earth. And one of the lines of the song, and I'm sure Trevor is going to sing it for us, and the, and the worship team will sing it for us, is that Christ Christ is born in Bethlehem, hope is on the horizon, the promised Messiah, angels, let your songs begin, here comes heaven. That's going to be the next theme for this next month as we celebrate our Messiah, which is good. Uh, but we are going to wrap up our series today. We've been studying the Bible to help us answer the question, what makes a healthy church? What does a healthy church look like? Our definition of what a healthy church is ought to match God's definition of a healthy church because it's God's church. And the New Testament paints this picture for us of God's plan for his church with this Greek word that shows up time and time and time again. About 101 times, the word is alelon. And when it is translated, it translates to one another. And it is God's dream for his church to be one the way the Trinity is one, to be this mutual, all-in, family, body, whatever you might call it, 
unity in Christ in him. And so along with this word, there are these directives, about 39 different directives of things that we're to do and not do together mutually as the body of Christ. And we've had a chance to look at about 10 of these over the last 10 weeks, and it's been really fruitful. Um, But these are things that really make up the framework of God's dream for a church. And what I love about this is that it's not a mystery. It's not for us to solve and figure out. God says, listen, here's what you need to do. Here's how you're to look. Here's what you're to be as a church. This is what I want, okay? And so this is what we've had a chance to study. So far, we did about 10 of these, like I said, and they've been really healthy. They've been really good. And I hope that you'll continue to study some of these more as as we go on um, together, uh, just living our lives together. But I want to wrap up our series today with one of my favorites, and this is Common Joy. And this is a perfect thing to be talking about, especially in the Thanksgiving season where we talk about being grateful for all that we've been given. We have been called to a common joy together. Did you know that? You are supposed to be happy people, all right? You're supposed to be. You're supposed to encourage one another. You're supposed to smile when you see each other. You're supposed to laugh together. Do you guys do some laughing together? I know this church is a, is a laughing church, okay? Yeah, ha, ha, ha. This is good. We are called by God in the framework of his church to be joyful, to have fun, to love each other. And this is really exciting. This is the perfect place in a sermon for joy to interject a cheesy sermon joke so that we can laugh together. So I'm going to do that, all right? Jesus is walking down by the gates of heaven one afternoon when an old man approached. St. Peter asked this man, well, what, did you, what have you done to deserve entry into heaven? I don't know why St. Peter is always at the gate in these kind of jokes. You ever notice that? I'm like, I don't, I don't get that. He's got the raw end. That's not how it really works. But anyway, he's at the gate. He says, what have you done to deserve entry into heaven? And the old man replies, well, to be honest, I am merely a simple carpenter. It was my son who was truly great. Although he wasn't my biological son, His birth was miraculous, to say the least. Still, I love him very much. Later in life, he went through a lot of different things. He spread joy, and his story is told all over the world, even to this day. Jesus, overhearing the conversation, looked at the man with a tear in his eye, and he said, Joseph? And the old man looked and said, Pinocchio? (laughs) Nothing. You get it? Okay, we, okay, that's it. Cheesy church joke. Here we go. What I want to do is I want to look at today's directive and words of encouragement from God's word. Could everyone read this together with me? Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Let's read this together. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, in true form for this study that we've been doing, I just want to point out that first we see the one another in this statement, right? This mutual all-in identity that we're supposed to have. What is the directive attached to this one another? What are we supposed to do together? Encourage, right? That's exactly right. Now, how often are we supposed to do it according to this verse? Daily, And if you need a little bit more specific instruction, he goes on to say, as long as it is called today, you know, I think we need that sometimes, don't we, as believers? Like, hey, encourage each other, but let me just tell you, so that you know, if the, if the day ends with day, that's when you're supposed to do it. So Monday, good, you got it. Wednesday, Sunday, every day, we're to encourage one another. What's at stake with encouraging one another in this? According to this verse. Yeah, yeah, that's a, okay, so this just gets a little bit more real then for us. This is to keep us so that no one may be hardened by sin. So that's a big deal. Listen, did you guys know it's tough to be a Christian? Anybody figure that one out? It's tough to go against the grain sometimes in this world, isn't it? It can be discouraging. We're also not only dealing with the world stuff, we're dealing with our own personal battles, Sin is challenging. Sin has a way of stealing life and hardening hearts. And guess what? Encouragement softens that. It 
it, it defends against that. Everybody needs encouragement in this room this morning. Everybody needs help when they've tripped. The Greek word here for encouragement is parakaleo. Can everybody say that? Parakaleo. That's right. And it basically paints the picture of someone that has fallen in the dust and has been picked up and brushed off. It basically means to lift up. All right, And so when we encourage one another, we're picking that person up out of the dust and we're wiping them off and we're saying, hey, it's okay. You got this. All right, That's what the word means. And the Bible uses, first of all, has anybody ever needed that in life before? Has anybody needed to help up out of the dirt? Has anybody needed that kind word or that compliment or that gift of love that just helps you in those times when you need it the most? Everybody. Has ever, everybody ever met somebody that doesn't receive encouragement very well? You know, I used to be one of those guys where I either thought that I had to be tough enough to do it so I didn't ask for help. I didn't want encouragement because I thought, hey, if I wasn't able to do it, then I shouldn't be doing it. When the reality is I needed help um, or I didn't want to have a big head. So this like false humility, I'd say, no, no, please, 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 don't, don't, you know, that's enough, that kind of stuff. Instead, we all need encouragement. And the Bible uses parakaleo in four main applications when it comes to life, okay? First, first they use it to cheer, to urge and to uh, appeal someone to move forward. It's to cheer on, cheer for somebody. It's a you got this kind of attitude. Great job. Proverbs talks about it. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and healthy for the body. It's like medicine for us, okay? It also is used in the application to cheer someone on in life. It's to come along one side and to say, listen, let me help you with this. You can do this. We can do this together. Proverbs 25 says, the right word at the right time is like a custom-made piece of jewelry. A wise friend's timely reprimand is like a gold ring slipped on the finger. It's also used in application to cheer somebody up. You cheer for somebody. You cheer them on, and then you cheer them up. We implore them. We comfort them. We say, you'll get through this. I know it hurts right now, but this will help you. Proverbs 12, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word cheers him up or makes him glad. All right? There's a fourth application to this, and I want to get to that at the very end of the sermon. So leave a little suspense for you because it's really cool. Um, but I want to have a little fun, and I want to practice this together today. We're going to give you an opportunity to encourage somebody, to either cheer them on, to cheer for them, or to cheer them up. And to do this, I'm going to give you an example. I want to show you a video of a guy that's going to, uh, he, 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 he plays with his music band um, at this church, and uh, he's trying his best to sing this song called Give Thanks. Do you guys ever know, you guys know that song? Give thanks with a grateful. So he's going to play that on a saxophone, and I want you guys to see this, and I want you to notice the face of the musicians as, they, as he tries to play this, and I want you to see that there's a problem, that's, that there, the problem that happens. Uh, and I want this, let's use this as an example to see how we can encourage this guy. So please play the video.
in every one of those guys' shoes on the stage. I've been the one like, oh man, this is not going to end. And then the other one, I've been the guy that started, on, what happened is he started on the wrong key. He said, it's in G and he started like in A flat or something and he just didn't, didn't stop. He went with it and went for it. Um, poor guy. Now listen, I've also been that place spiritually too where I am trying my best to give thanks. I'm trying my best to give my worship to the Lord and I am falling flat, man. I am feel like it's just not enough. And we all are in places like that where we need to encourage that person. And you notice one guy was trying to put his arm out to say, okay, um, hey, buddy, we love you. How can we encourage? Now, listen, we could either lift, cheer that guy, cheer for that guy, cheer on that guy, cheer up that guy, or we can beat him down and we can mock him and we can make fun of him and stuff like that. What are we supposed to do as believers? I mean, absolutely, right? We're supposed to encourage one another. In fact, the own, our own English definition of encourage means to put courage into something. It means to put courage in, to inject courage. We vastly underestimate our deep-seated need to be encouraged because there are times like this in our life where we fall flat and we need somebody to come alongside us to tell us, hey, you can do this. Let's correct this. Let's get to where we need to be. Let's dust off and get back on our feet. Encouragement is one of the greatest gifts that Christians can offer anybody, right, apart right, with salvation that they have on, in their arsenal. And how much does encouragement cost for believers? It's totally free, and it's abundant, and we have a massive resource of it in Jesus Christ, and yet oftentimes it is so neglected. Why do you think that is? Have you ever noticed that we have the tendency to pick at each other's faults more than we have at encouraging one another when we're down? I bet if you wanted to, you could find 10 faults with me right now without even thinking. That's not an invitation, by the way. Please put your hand down. Okay. Instead, we need to be encouraging one another. How are we at encouraging one another at Trinity? How are we at doing that? Today, I hope to show you that there's something about this word that can radically change the way that we do church, radically change the way that we see each other, radically change the way that we approach our brothers and sisters in Christ when they're a little flat, when they're a little off key. How do we do it together? Let's look at scripture and look at God's instruction for encouragement. This is God's way to lift us up. First of all, in fact, that's number one for me. We have the word of God as an incredible source of encouragement for our life. We encourage each other with the word of God. There is this really short verse with this profound message found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says this, so encourage each other with these words. Paul was saying that to a church that was struggling with end times and all these things, and he was using God's truth to lift them up in encouragement. The primary means of encouraging one another is the word of God, and it's an incredible resource for us. There are absolute promises that we can claim in Jesus Christ through his word that we could be giving to one another to lift each other up and giving each other joy. Isn't that amazing? And basically, there is content to the encouragement that we have. It's more than a pat on the back. It's more than a little cliche word. It's a claim of a truth in God through Jesus Christ to encourage one another through incredible divine promises found in his word. Is that not exciting? That's incredible. Titus chapter one speaks of encouraging one another with sound doctrine. That's encouraging when we do that. Second Timothy chapter four, Timothy was charged, preach the word in season and out. Do this to correct, to rebuke, and to encourage. We are to do this together. Listen, this is what I want you to do. Try this this week. Grab some part of God's word, some promise, use a psalm, go through the testaments, whatever it might be. Find something that is encouraging, write it on a piece of paper or something, and give it to another person this week with a mission to encourage someone with God's word. It is incredible. Have you ever done this, by the way? Have you ever received encouragement from God's word? before? It's an incredible gift. It's an amazing gift. It's powerful. It doesn't return void. It's the power of God for salvation, all right? Not only 
Do we use God's word to encourage? But we have a mission with encouragement. We have a reason for it. We are to encourage each other for the purpose of building up your relationship with God. When I encourage you, I want to do it with a mission to build up your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what 1 Thessalonians says. Encourage one another and build each other up just as you are already doing. Our mission is to encourage. Another word for this is edification. You ever heard that? It's where we edify each other to build up that relationship with Jesus Christ. When I first heard that word, I was in high school, and we had a bunch of high school buddies, and, and uh, we were learning about edification. And I remember uh, there was one point where we were being sarcastic with each other, and some guys were joking around, and I stopped and said, man, you got to edify, stupid, that kind of thing. And <laughs> didn't work that well for me. But we have to, as we grow towards maturity, be lifting and building each other up. Throughout your spiritual life, you'll always need to be growing in your faith. That's just a reality. You are going to be building and building and building and maturing and growing every single day as long as you're on this planet. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus uh, for as long as, you know, the dinosaurs roamed on the earth. You are still growing in Christ. And it's through this that you need someone to come alongside you to encourage you to build that relationship, okay? This is going beyond being nice. This is uh, just interacting in such a way where you're going beyond the high how are you's and going, listen, how are you really? How is things going in your life? Uh, Pastor Trevor talked about this and uh, spoke about this in Galatians chapter six where he said we carry each other's burdens. We go to each other and we say, listen, in truth and love, I have to tell you this so that your relationship with Christ can be built up. You're trusting and building relationships with each other. It's amazing. See, the danger that we have as believers is over time, if we're not pursuing, building up our relationship with God, we run into these spiritual ruts, all right? My wife has coined a phrase that I like. She said, we become dunners. She's been going to church since she was a baby, and she says, you know, there are times where I just feel like I've been to the church services, I've been to the, I've heard the songs, I've prayed, I've done the Bible studies, and I'm just done it. I've, I'm done. And those are the times where you've got to have somebody come alongside you and challenge you to build that faith so that you don't go stagnant, okay? So here's where you're at. That might be some of you, okay? Here's where you're at if that happens. I want to challenge you. Do something with your faith that you haven't done before. Go on a missions trip if you've not done a missions trip. Read a book that you haven't run. Get to, get to know some new theological point. Be encouraged by sound doctrine. Whatever it might be, do something that moves you forward in your growth and maturity in Christ. Okay, we need to be challenging each other to do that. You and I should be challenging each other to build up your relationship with God. Does that make sense? It's important that we do that. Okay, another thing we do, number three, is we encourage to guard one another. We are guardians of each other. Okay, Hebrews chapter three, we read this earlier. Daily encouragement keeps your brothers and sisters from turning away in sin. That's incredible, okay? Now I want you to notice the strong sense of spiritual obligation within this text. How does these verses start? What's it say? Does it say, boy, it would be nice if someone would consider doing this from time to time? Or does it say, boy, if someone really ought to say something nice here and there? What's it say? Very strong words. It says, see to it that you are doing this, that this is a priority for your life. I hope that also you catch within this verse that not encouraging each other is equivalent to having an unbelieving heart that turns away from God. Do you see that? That's another big problem. That's how important this is. The old adage that says if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, doesn't work for believers. Listen, if you can't say anything nice, then there's probably something wrong with your spirit right now. You've got to get it checked out because you have the holy living hope inside of you. And you ought to be able to be encouraged and encouraged. It doesn't mean that there's not hard times. It doesn't mean there's not sadness. It doesn't mean there's not hardships. But you've got to be able to get to a point where you're 
are guarding one another with encouragement. I wonder if there's so many hardened hearts in this world today because they're not seeing enough Christians encouraging one another. Instead, we're battling one another and in competition with one another and we're picking at each other's faults and things like that. Encouraging has the power to soften hearts and protect somebody from sin deceit. Do you want that? You want to be that for somebody? That's what we do. It's an obligation to encourage people and to do it as long as it is today. Okay? Number four, we encourage to celebrate one another. Hebrews chapter 10 says that, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together in the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We meet together as a church for the reason of celebration, okay? We're to celebrate. I'm to celebrate you. I'm to celebrate what God is doing in you. I'm to celebrate what God is doing in his church and what God is doing and what he will do in the future. Our church service ought to include a time where we are just magnifying God. And that's what I love about singing. That's what I love about the word of God is we ought to be taking time to say, thank you, God. You're awesome. Celebrating God, establishing relationships, sharing testimonies of what God has done, intimate Bible studies, where we're involved in each other's lives. We have to be there. There are some that are in the habit of making excuses for why it's not important to go to church or why it's not important to be in a community. That sort of idea alienates you and sets you apart for destruction just like a sheep who wanders away from the fold. What happens to that sheep when they wander away? They get eaten by wolves. They jump off of cliffs. They get lost, whatever it might be. We've got to encourage and meet together to celebrate. So I want to close today with that fourth application of the word encourage in Scripture, parakaleo, okay? And I think this is really cool, and I think you're going to love this. On three different occasions, Jesus describes a Holy Spirit who is going to come after he ascends, who is going to come and help the church. And at different times in John, he, he, he talks about it. He says, and I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper. Um, John 14, the same uh, passage, it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, will teach you things. In John 15, he says, this helper is going to bear witness about Jesus Christ. Three different times he uses this word helper. And each time that Jesus identifies the Holy Spirit, he uses the word parakaletos, which means the encourager. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? When we encourage in the name of Jesus Christ, and we do it together, we are doing the work of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Isn't that cool? This is really, really cool. Listen, when you encourage one another in Jesus Christ, you are a living cross-reference to God. That's amazing. You represent the very nature and power of God through the Holy Spirit. When you speak encouraging words to each other, you are speaking the words of the Holy Spirit. Has anybody ever said, boy, I wish I could hear the Holy Spirit speak to me. Boy, I wish he could just say some words to me. You know that. You hear it when you are encouraging one another in Jesus Christ. That's how he speaks. It's incredible how many people... In life, need to hear that today. When you encourage someone with the promise of the word of God, when you minister to each other, building up your relationships in Christ with each other, when you get together and you meet together in the name of the Lord and you celebrate what God is doing and you celebrate what God will do, you're doing the work of the Holy Spirit. How many people would love to hear that today? How many moms and dads would love to hear a, you got this, you're doing a great job? How many grieving people dealing with loss or dealing with illness need to hear somebody come alongside them and say, you can get through this. Here's some promises from God's word. How many people working hard could use someone to say, let's do this together. Let me come alongside you and cheer for you and cheer you on. This is where the church of Jesus Christ shines on on this planet. When we can do this, I want to throw all these 10 one another's that we have 
This is what we've been studying. But listen, this is just 10 of the 39. Okay, and it doesn't end here with this series. This is the beginning. This is where I make a plead to Trinity Church to apply these truths to our life, to apply this into the family life of Jesus Christ. When we come, we want to be the healthy church that God wants us to be, and we can do that when we are one as Christ is one, and we apply these things to our life. Listen, the devil is on a covert war to divide the church and to scatter the family of God to keep us from understanding the true power that we have when we are together. He knows that a house divided against itself cannot stand. He knows that if we stay as individuals, meaning if we don't come together with a mutual purpose and identity in Christ, but instead we stay in our own little worlds, we come and we mind our own little business, it won't, we won't ever storm the gates of hell, we won't see miracles happen, we won't claim the promises of God for his church. And that's why he's against it. When we obey the word of God, and we take these one another's and we make them the framework for our church. The Bible says that we defeat the devil. We start to see things that the early church saw. Devotion to the word of God, to fellowship, to prayer, to awesome and amazing wonders of testimony of God's work. We see a devotion to commonality and purpose, to fellowship, to identity, to commandment, to our heritage, to correction for one another, to forgiveness to one another, to care in each other's burdens, to submission to one another that Andy spoke of last week, to praying for one another, and ultimately to this divine joy that connects us to the very nature of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of church that I want to be. And that's the kind of church we can be when we are faithful. And all of this ties to unity and love. These qualities make the church stand out apart from the world and unite us within kingdom thinking. So we do this together. And when we do it, we show the world we are his disciples because we love one another. Let's pray together and then we'll sing another song. God, it is important that we have joy. We understand that you have called us because of the riches that we have in Christ to be people that are exalting you with a heaven mindset. And this heaven mindset brings eternal joy and satisfaction. We have so much to be thankful for. As we come together this week around the Thanksgiving table, oh God, may we be both thankful and grateful and we, may we be giving in the way that we give thanks. God, I would pray that your word of God, the word of God would go before us and it would encourage us with these absolute truths. And that God, as we consider who we are in you, we would consider this amazing joy that we have, this common joy. We're in Christ we have everything. And God, it's within that that we need to come along to each other and we need to cheer for each other. We need to cheer on each other. We need to cheer up each other and we need to do the work of the Holy Spirit as we help one another through encouragement. God, may we be a church that edifies. Maybe we a church that picks people out of the dust when we've fallen flat. May we help them dust off and lift them up before you. May we build relationships, not only with each other, but may we encourage one another to build our relationships to maturity in God. And God, may your word be that resource for us. And God, I ultimately think of those people who want to be a part of this church. Because what I understand about the early church is when they were common in purpose and these amazing things were happening and they were devoted to the word of God, the Bible says that thousands came daily. And I don't think it was to see Peter and John or to see the disciples. I think it's because they felt the commonality in the Holy Spirit's presence and they wanted a part of it. And so God, I would pray that this church would rise to the occasion to be one as you are one so that thousands out there that so desperately need to hear the message of living hope will come flocking to experience the love and the truth that you only you can provide. Maybe there's some here today that are here. They're coming here because they just, there's something different. 
And they're here and they're just checking things out. Before you can understand this joy, friend, before you can understand this peace, before you can understand this living hope, you have got to make a decision to go to the cross. The cross is the key. It is the bridge. It's what opens the door to eternal life. And it is by the cross and the cross of Jesus Christ. When he came down to this earth, he opened the door for heaven through the cross. He came, heaven came down to us. He lived a sinless life. And then he died on the cross on behalf of the sin of the world. He paid for the penalty of sin. He was put in the grave. He was dead for three days. But then he rose from the dead, conquering death and sin for all time. And that same resurrection is available for you today through the cross when you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. It's not your works that you're saved. Even if you get to know all these one another's, if you don't go to the cross first, you're falling short. And I would invite you today to kneel at the cross of Jesus Christ and surrender your life to him. For those of us that have done that, our sins are washed white as snow. We have been given a living hope. We've been given the Holy Spirit that seals us for the day of redemption. And until that day comes, we can get together and we can encourage each other as long as it is called today because our hope is secure, is forever. And until that time where we one day stand before your face in glory, I pray that we will live our life encouraging one another. Oh God, may you be exalted through this church and through the church of Jesus Christ. It's in your name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.